Get your brand on board with our podcast and a sponsorship campaign and get into the earphones of 100,000 plus highly engaged music and comedy fans within our show and across ACAST's other famous podcasts. I'll even come up with a creative for you. Get in touch via producerpool.co.uk and we'll have a chat about how it works. A funny taste in music with Andrew Bird. Hello. How are you? All right. Good, good, good. Nice to nice to talk to you in this uh, very much one-sided conversation. Uh, this is A Funny Taste in Music, a podcast where I talk to comedians about music. Um, yeah, well self-indulgent. But then, I mean, what 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 is a podcast if it's not self-indulgent? It is a person talking to somebody they like about something they like and recording themselves. This is the most self-indulgent... I don't know how we're all getting away with this. Anyway, thanks for listening. Um, so, this week, Lloyd Langford. Uh, my mate, Lloyd. Now, I always, I kind of knew, like, as I was saying this, he doesn't really, uh, you know, he doesn't push his music on people. He just quietly gets about his business with it. Um, I had no idea how obsessed he was. I knew he was really into the blues, because he did a show about uh, the blues, kind of. Uh, Edinburgh um so I knew he was into the blues but I had no idea how much and uh and Lloyd is one of my mates that I've known for ages in stand up and he's one of them one of them he talks very slow and considered um but then whenever he tells a story it just unravels into madness just just like a standard story and then out of nowhere the most he's a he's a magnet for nutters basically as well um so i was looking forward to talking to lloyd he's in australia while we're recording this he moved to australia uh which i would say good call um he moved to australia and i haven't spoke to him for a while so it was bloody lovely to talk to him um so i hope you enjoy it thanks for listening and i i'm going on tour in october and november so if you've enjoyed the podcast and think he's he's uh i mean i'd like to see him do stand up this bloke you know he's drawn me in somehow uh through getting on much more famous comedians than him and getting them to retweet so he gets more listeners he's drawn me in he's drawn me in um then come come to the gig if you go www.andrewbirdcomedian.com all the dates and tickets are there. I'm not going to go through them all now when you just want to listen to a podcast. What kind of an animal would do that? Um, so here we go. Here's Lloyd. Uh, donate to the Patreon page, please, because I lost my livelihood for a year. Let's bear that in mind. Uh, so here we go. Lloyd Langford. A funny taste in music. The interview next. How are you, Lloyd? Very good, very good. Uh, the Melbourne Comedy Festival has just finished, like a week ago. Has it? Hang on, what so, time is um, it there now? You got a gig tonight? No, I'm not working this weekend. Um, it finished like last Sunday, so I'm just I've just kind of had the week off, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I've had a year off. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't my choice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't get to, I don't get to choose to have time off, Lloyd. My, mine's more the choice of a global pandemic. <laughs> yeah, I just had a week off. Why not? Wow. Well, no, I've the... been right. I've I've been writing on stuff. You know, I have I have been working every night this week, but um, I haven't I haven't done a gig for a week. I'm yeah, getting no, a bit rusty. Not... I don't I don't think we'll put out the bit where you've just said I've just had a week off. I think it'll be... <laughs> A lot of English comedians that will fucking hate you for that. <laughs> yeah, just had a week off. What's the Melbourne Festival been like? It was pretty normal. Um, first ever show, the audience were in masks, and then after that, they, they changed the law, and so they didn't have to wear masks anymore if they didn't want to. And it was... 75 capacity 75 percent capacity for all the venues until probably halfway through the festival it went up to 100. who um, how many people were doing jokes about keeping theirs at 75 percent capacity tops <laughs> no matter well, for safety I for the audience and lack of interest 
I, I I had to put on an extra show, and the venue that my extra show was in with 75% capacity was 600 seats, and with 100% capacity was 900. Oh, so I, I wasn't really happy that it went up to full capacity. <laughs> yeah, you could put sell out on the board because of the law <laughs> change. <laughs> Well, that's fun. I imagine the amount of people that'll have jokes about that when Edinburgh comes back. That I was, I was social distancing for years before it, <laughs> before it was needed. Really safe already. Now, Kat goes at the door, smiling with the fact he's scratching at the door. She doesn't give a shit about. You can go and sort that out if you want. About professional um. recordings. No, she should do something in this house. Now she said, "Fuck off through the door." <clears throat> um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, um, how, how, how long have you been in Melbourne now? Uh, since February 2020. What's that? 14 yeah, months? I remember when you were going. Yeah, because um, I did your, um, Bista gig, I think. Bista, yeah, Buckingham, I think. Yeah, and then you went not long after that. I remember thinking, that, that seems like a good call. <laughs> Turns out it was. It was a bloody good idea. <laughs> well done. Um, you Thank staying? You. you think you're going to stay in Australia now for the foreseeable future? <clears throat> well, w- I'm waiting for a partnership visa with Anne, and so at the moment, I can't really leave Australia um, without applying for another visa, and also. She can't come to the UK without a work visa and I can't come back into Australia because I don't have the partnership visa yet. So we're sort of, we're stuck here. I mean, at the moment though, the only place that's just opened up with Australia is New Zealand. Um, I could get back to the UK, I think, as a British citizen, but then there's loads of Australians that are still trapped there and can't get back because there's so few flights and stuff. Um, well, they're out. It would be risky. It would be risky for me to go. Adam Hills is like flying back and forth, like fucking really? wind fog. Uh, <laughs> he's, but, he's got the Friday think, night project to make. He's got Mark Oliver's <laughs> income to think of. <laughs> um, I think he's got like. I think he's 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 paying for like first class tickets and stuff, which is the is a way of guaranteeing that you will be on the plane, I guess. How oh, is it? Ugh. Dirty I think it's bastards. I think I think I think the the seats have gone up across the board in general. Cause Hannah and Carl came over and I think it was five thousand pound return. And in the day in the morning they were looking at the flights it was five grand and by the evening it was thirteen thousand pound. And the next day, they just booked them a five, and it went up again to thirteen again. Jesus Christ! Wow, you you're gonna yeah. be wanting selling more than seventy five percent of your tickets <laughs> <laughs> to recoup that. What we in a sixty seater? <laughs> I don't know if we're gonna cover tra- cover travel here. Bloody! <laughs> but uh, so. Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, I was chatting to Rod, and he, oh, yeah. in passing, mentioned uh, he described you as listening to some obscure blues with your massive feet. <laughs> I think that's how he described you. And I and I remember going, "Oh yeah, I forgot that. I forgot how much Lloyd was into blues." So I remember because I remember you had a you did an Edinburgh show. What was it called again? Every Every Day of the Blues. Every, y- yeah, it was called Every Day I Have the Blues, and it was like a show where I was trying to do a sort of stand-up comedy version of blues music. So blues music traditionally is men complaining. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to do that in a sort of comedy format. So it was a list where it was a show full of things that upset me yeah. or annoyed me. In the blues, it's usually like, you know, <clears throat> my... Um, my my woman's you know left or even worse i've come back home early and she's you know stuck in some other guy in my bed 
<laughs> or you know, I've I've um, drank too much whiskey, or um, I haven't got any whiskey left. I think those are the four main topics of blues songs. Yeah, isn't isn't there quite a lot of uh, you know, the landowner could kill me and stuff like that, and this cotton picking yeah, there's job. A lot of- yeah, there's a, there's a lot work. of um, there's a lot of because it kind of originated from like field haulers and chants and stuff when people are working. I say working. I guess that a lot of them were sort of in uh, slavery. <laughs> I'm um, glad you went that way. With it. I thought you were going to go. I say working. They weren't doing a lot. <laughs> no. They were already part time. <laughs> I thought that's the way you were going to go. I say working. No, no. <laughs> Lazy bastards. Um, Cowboys. Were, a lot of them. They would sing and and um, chant and stuff to keep rhythm with the work they were doing, and then yeah. it, it kind of like developed from there. And you you took that to the middle class white Edinburgh festival <laughs> <laughs> about about uh, ninety years hence. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I wasn't I wasn't uh, directly comparing my situation to their years. <laughs> no, that would have been a funny way to go. Uh, well, that's why it's quite funny, the fact that you're so into blues. But it's funny, but then it's not really when you... Uh, it seems obvious. Why aren't more people in the blues? It's where it all, it's where it all started, isn't it? Most music all comes from there, most of it. But it's quite funny, uh, you know, a, a very pasty white man <laughs> from Port Talbot... <laughs> Is so into blues music. I don't, how I can't imagine. What, when did you get into it? Do you get into it from a young age as well? I can imagine you as a grumpy. Yeah, I was a fucking, I've blues. always been a fucking loser, mate. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no one's questioning that. I I got into like um, you know, kind of classic rock kind of stuff when I was in high school. So I don't know, like Led Zeppelin and. Um, the doors and all that kind of stuff. And then you quickly realise, like, the stones or whatever, but, like, they, certainly in the case of Led Zeppelin, stole a lot of the blue songs. Yeah. Um, I think the stones were better in that they credited some of the writers and they ended up getting them royalties and using them to support them on tour and stuff. Whereas I think Led Zeppelin just pinched a whole bunch of it kind of outright and just pretended it was traditional. Oh, right. I didn't know that. They've got a very bad reputation for nicking um, music off, not just blues musicians, off a lot of different, like, four keys and um, lots of lots of people have gripes with Led Zeppelin. You can Google, um, like, Led Zeppelin uh, thievery or whatever, and the, and the, you'll get numerous examples. And uh, yeah, royalty battles and stuff. Not royalty battles. Um, what's the word? Uh, um, publishing battles and all that. Yeah, they, suits and stuff. Yeah, I think they. I think they just sort of didn't. Or they, you know, like I say, they said, "Ah, oh, this is a traditional song." And then the some old fucking blues guy that wrote it, who's in Mississippi, is none the wiser now that it's like top of the charts. Yeah. And they, uh, when would that be? Led Zeppelin, when would that have been? They, they would have, uh, they didn't foresee, you know, Google and YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and one day everyone would have access to this bloke in Mississippi. <laughs> How will anyone ever know? They must have <laughs> shit themselves. When There must be a lot of musicians who, when Google, what, you can go- find out anything now, where anything came from. Shit, that's going to get awkward, isn't it? There must have been a they few did, musicians who had that from the si- sort of 60s and 70s who thought, no one will know, we can nick that. They they just had a long-running legal battle which ended over, I think, the guitar riff in Stairway to Heaven sounds very similar to a song, I think, by a band called Spirit. It's called Taurus. I think it's, I remember it, that. I think- it kind of sounds identical, but um, I think they kind of just kind of pled ignorance despite I think sharing a bill with them yeah. <laughs> they did like a gig together and then they were like oh yeah we've just come up with Stairway to Heaven <laughs> yeah. the, the, the guitarist from Spirit was like hang on a minute and but we, yeah, might, uh, we might change up the support bands for the next tour <laughs> <laughs> it might get awkward because they're going to be on first they're going to be on before us 
<laughs> there's no way you can go you know that song you wrote can you not do it because it's similar to the one we stole from you <laughs> that's all I mean I've done we've we've done gigs like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah mentioning no names with people on um, I whatsapp you their names um, you know them but, but yeah that. but yeah I did see that Rolling Stones have always they've all they got people they can't they kind of went to america like generally speaking and said to the uh, the white american people are you not heard of, why are you not listening to these why are you not listening yeah. to them? these are all in they're all in your country play it it's on the radio all the time and you've not know how have you not noticed don't There's like us we, we nicked it from them but they, they yeah and they got loads of them on telly and stuff as well was it howling wolf i think yeah yeah there's a great book by a guy called Stanley Booth who writes like a memoir of being on the road of the Rolling Stones. I can't quite remember the name of it, but it's kind of famous. And he talks about how when they did this tour of the States, the Stones wanted like the best support acts they could get. And so they oh. got like B.B. King and they got like Ike and Tina Turner and stuff. And he was saying that they kind of regretted getting Ike and Tina Turner because they had the full Ikeettes and everything and Ike Turner's playing the guitar like a fucking madman and they yeah. found it difficult to follow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Their yeah. support act, they were like, we're championing these people who are like brilliant and then they were like, oh yeah, they are brilliant and now we've got to go on after them. <laughs> and we've paid them to make a <laughs> shitter. Yeah. Oh, good on them for that though. I kind of respect yeah, them for that. it's good. Yeah, they. It's quite funny that though that uh, you know all that music was there in Mississippi and Chicago and that, and it took some blokes with weird accents from Richmond to, <laughs> to regurgitate it and go, no, they, yeah. Um, but yeah, they they uh, yeah they were because they people that they didn't know about them and then they were like amazing guitarists because yeah. just because it's on acoustic guitar. Sometimes you don't realise how good it is because it doesn't, yeah, and got the oomph, fuzz it, of electric guitar. No. So then when they're on massive gigs, you'd have gone fucking <laughs> hell. That must have been, Keith Richards must have been going, shit, shit, I've got to follow that. He's the, he's the bollocks. I've been trying to copy him for years. I think they went to Chicago as well. They went to Chess Records, The Stones, and they recorded some songs. There's a song they actually recorded about Chess Records. I went to Chicago once um, on a blues holiday. I was invited to go with Rod Gilbert and his now wife, but then girlfriend, Sean, and his best mate from school, a guy called Ed. And a couple of weeks before the holiday, Rod rang me up and said, I've got some bad news for you. Um, I've invited you on this holiday to Chicago. But um, now I'm no longer going. This this sounds fairly standard. <laughs> Rod so Gilbert organisation. He he'd been offered a television show. It was like I don't know. It was like Michael McIntyre's comedy road show Christmas special or something. Yeah. And he um, he took the gig. So I had to go on holiday with Sean and his best mate from school I'd never met before. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you found it weird. Sean must have been like, what the fuck? No, I suppose Sean would have been like, yeah, this all seems a standard holiday with Rod. He's organised yeah, it, it and then is it there? <laughs> <laughs> I think he 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 came out later. But he I think he didn't come to Chicago. He just went to, I think he met Sean in New York, I think. That's kind, of, that's kind of a what we doing today kind of thing in New York. Rod Beale, well, well, whatever you want to do, really, I think you could probably choose. <laughs> <laughs> I can't turn up now and go, I'll tell you what I really want to do today. <laughs> um, but so, oh, I like that, the sound of that. Was it called that, a blues holiday? <clears throat> or did you call it, was, it that? No, yeah, it was... Uh, it was his idea and he was like you're into blues music we'll just go to loads of different clubs and stuff and just see loads of life bands and um <laughs> we friend. yeah me and sean and ed did that and then because i think the holiday was only supposed to be a week or something and i stayed longer actually on my own and um i went to some jazz clubs as well 
It was Jesus. really cool. We were I staying. We we arrived in Chicago, and our hotel was right next to Buddy Guy's Blues Club, who's a very famous Chicago blues guitarist. And then yeah. we went to go in there, and they wouldn't let us in because we didn't have ID. So we had to go back to the hotel and get our passports. Yeah, we got baby face. <laughs> And then I went in there and went to the bar, ordered a beer, and then I looked to my right and Buddy Guy was like sat at a bar. And, no uh, way! Yeah, and I, I was just fucking like, Ronald McDonald. McDonald's. <laughs> I was, he like, was shaking. In there. I was like shaking with excitement, and he, but he because I was like chatting to the barman later on, and he was like, "Oh, sometimes he'll he'll get up and play your, you know, if there'll be a band on, he'll kind of join in with them and stuff." But he didn't. He he didn't play that night. He he does these gigs every Christmas, I think, in Chicago that are always kind of sold out. And I think yeah. we just I know we just missed them, or they'd all I think they'd all already been sold out. We found out about them when we arrived. Uh yeah, they'll be sold out, won't they? they? You have to be in the know to get them, I imagine. But we had some fun. There was a, one time we went to this club, and there was a guy on who was absolutely wild, and he was called Lindsay Alexander and it was a really small club and he was playing his electric guitar but he had a very long lead so he would be walking through the crowd <laughs> and there was like a family in from like the Midwest and they looked very kind of conservative like mum and dad and daughter who I reckon was like very late teens and maybe early 20s and he Lindsay Alexander was started singing this song about his um, girlfriend keeping her pussy nice and clean. <laughs> what? It was like, it was this dirty blue song and he was like wandering through the crowd and the yeah. lo- like the look on this family's faces was worth that entry fee, like alone. It was so funny. You were thinking, fucking hell, Lindsay, read the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Or, <laughs> that sounds like a like a modern shitty pop song that we joke about that how bad the lyrics are, but sung in an old man blues voice. Sounds quite you know. There's lo- there's loads of those old blues songs that are like very Filf. filthy. Uh, and yeah, and they, 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 of- they didn't. But they didn't sing them knowing that they sang them and make each other laugh in like a little club where they live or just uh, like while they're working and shit they didn't sing it knowing there'd be a room full of people with a midwest family there did they (laughs) it wasn't wrote with a commercial you know (laughs) evening entertainment in mind some of them are recorded um you want to listen to um lucille borgen shave them dry you can get it on youtube it's absolute Sh- filth. Yeah? Yeah. What was it it's called? Like, shave them? Yeah, Lucille Borg and Shave Them Dry. Yeah. It's got, like, if you if you download it on um, iTunes, it's got the little explicit warning yeah. next to it. Lovely. <laughs> I th- I, I'm, I'm going to have to get the lyrics up here now. Oh, you want to know what the I, lyrics I, are? I, I, no, I, w- I wouldn't want to misquote. Um, this kind of uh, filth. And she says, I got nipples on my titties, big as the end of my thumb. I got something between my legs and make a dead man come. Oh, baby, won't you shave and dry? No, now draw it out. Won't you to grind me, baby? Grind me till I cry. Uh huh. So I fucked all night and all the night before, baby. And I feel just like I want to fuck some more. Oh, great God, daddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's going to be an awkward. That's going to be an awkward car journey home for that Midwest family. <laughs> <laughs> if they were there for that. Um, but that sounds like a Miley Cyrus song. <laughs> I didn't realise it was such filth. Some of it some of it, they can get away with it, though, can't they? Because the way they sing it, you can, ba- you can barely decipher a lot of the lyrics, to be fair. So they can get away with a bit of it, but not that level of filth. No, this one, no, it's pretty uh, confronting. <laughs> Confronting that is a good word for it. You know, you know, if a song starts with "I've got nipples on my titties big as the end of my thumb," that it's it's only going to go downhill from there. Yeah, that's not that's not going to end with "I will always love you," is it? 
<laughs> yeah. Um, but so where? Because I've I've always thought that of going to America. Of my first thought of going to America would not be to go. I wouldn't want to go to uh, like the standard sort of touristy New York kind of place. I thought I'd want to do something like that, like either Memphis or, but not you know. I'd want, but Chicago as well. Um, those like Chicago and uh, and yeah, maybe maybe like a uh, Detroit as well. Proper oh, yeah. grimy. Yeah, Motown. Yeah, the- kind of grimy play, uh, uh, places with loads of music history. That's where I'd want to go on holiday if I went to America. You proper, you proper did it a blues holiday. That's great. What it else did you good. do? Were you there? Um, we we went to the Museum of Chicago and saw um, some dinosaur bones. Oh, you did um, some touristy stuff then. Yeah, went to the. Um, do you know um, the painting American Gothic? It's like two old farmers. One of them's holding a pitchfork. And oh yeah, yeah. It's like a guy and angry, yeah. angry guy and angry woman. I went to see that in the art gallery, and. Mm. We went to the cinema one night and watched, like, it was like an old Art Deco cinema and watched um, some, like, old cartoons or something. I think I think that was Sean's idea. We went to Lords of Blues Clubs. Oh, um, that sounds like a cracking holiday going to a load of blues clubs. It was very, it was early January and it is bitterly, bitterly cold. Um, yeah. And I think in the in the summertime they have blues festivals and stuff, and it's a bit um, more hospitable. But because it's right on Lake Michigan, in the winter you just got like it's just freezing cold. But um, <laughs> we had like thermal. Did you did you um, when you toured with Rod? Did he buy you like a? a oh, I big got the coat. Fir- yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I still so got I, it. I, I, I had wore it this coat. morning. That's my dog walking coat. <laughs> I had that big fat coat on, and um, yeah, yeah it, was, he, it, it, it was a lot of fun. He did, a, he did one of his work experiences. He did. Uh, he was in the Breckens, and they gave him a load of, uh, or he bought specifically what they told him to buy, equipment, and one of it was that coat, which is you could survive in freezing temperatures overnight wearing that coat, as he said about <laughs> a thousand times. <laughs> And he went on and on about that coat. And then the end of the tour, he bought me, you, Rick, the driver, and Simon, yeah. his tour manager one. And I send him a photo. Fo- every winter at some point at the start of winter, I send him a photo. <laughs> and it's referred to as the rod coat. I go, where's my rod coat? And uh, I wore it this morning on the dog walk. So that you got your money's worth out of that. In the, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a good court. It is a good go, and you uh, you wore it with him while you were there freezing. You didn't dick about. You put that hard work in for a blues holiday. Yeah, you could have gone in the summer when it's a festival and easy. <laughs> You're there freezing, huddled, go, doing that, going to art galleries. What a holiday! I mean, it was his idea to go then, and then he didn't fucking go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was good. Um, yeah, it's a, it sounds like a, a good holiday he didn't have. No. A cracking idea. Um, so, yeah, so he knew, because he mentioned how much you were in the blues. I didn't know he was, but uh, he mentioned that. And I remember you were. <laughs> but how, like, why? So you were, you listened to, like, normal school age Led Zeppelin and all that. Doors. That's, yeah. even that's quite, not all teenagers listen to that. I listened to the Doors when I was quite young. And looking back on it now, <laughs> I used to do my paper round. I was about 12, 13, <laughs> right? Six in the morning, dark and cold. Streets are deserted, just with the doors on. That's fucking moody music to listen to on your own in the dark, doing your paper round. But, um, but so that that's quite weird for a teenager that you were into that. But then, was, when, so when did you I, get into the blues? So I think there was there was lots of that kind of stuff and like Pink Floyd and like basically like dope smoking music like when you're a teenager and then yeah. I remember I got like a, a Captain Beefheart album um, called Safe as Milk which is this kind of weird sort of experimental you know he's got a kind of yowly voice and they they use a theremin on it and Ray Cooder plays on it it's a good, great mad kind of weird album like sort of 
yeah. tail end of the 60s kind of psychedelia. I remember I was, I don't know if I was listening to it or I was like talking to someone about it and they were like, oh, if you like Captain Beefheart, then he's basically just pretending to be Howling Wolf. Like you need to listen to Howling Wolf. And I went to Spillers in, in Cardiff, which I think is the, the oldest record shop in the world. I don't know if it's, I think it's it's still running. The oldest um, record shop in the world? Apparently, I think it was, it's famous for maybe, maybe it's the oldest record shop in the United Kingdom, but it's been there a real long time. It's in a different place now. It's in the arcade. There's got to be some record shops in like Jerusalem. That are old. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. And it's still there. Since re- is it? Is it really since it's records it. began? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's good. The um, oldest record shop since records <laughs> began. Is that it, an old standard joke? It, I've never heard that. No, I just improvised it and then you sort of bailed out of it halfway through. <laughs> I, did, I thought it was too silly. You bailed out um, of it halfway through and I trampled <laughs> over it and stole it as my own. Oh, what a, horrible, fine, mo- what a horrible moment for both of us, that was. It's mine um, now. Uh, <laughs> that's a fucking brilliant joke. It's the oldest record shop. I've been there since records began. <laughs> well, hang on. You're in Melbourne. I'm yep. in Bicester. I think we can both have that joke. Yeah, yeah. Don't pretend you don't want it and you're above you it. Could, you can have it in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah, yeah. If we're, if, we're, uh, if we're ever gigging in the same hemisphere, we'll just double check who's done what. Kind of like, <laughs> kind of like Led Zeppelin would have been doing. <laughs> Have you yeah. done this since records began? Joke. Uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, uh, I'll do stuff about Boris Johnson. Then you'll have nothing on that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, so that's still there in in Cardiff. It's a, it's not in the same premises, but the shop is still there. It's in one of the arcades, right? Um, near TK Maxx. Anyway. <laughs> they had they had a, a double C D of two of Howling Wolf two of Howling Wolf's albums. Yeah. And I bought that and then listened to that and I was like, this is incredible. Like the um the musicians on it are like insanely good, the guitarists and the just his voice and uh, the harmonica. It's very primal kind of um Chicago blues where I think a lot of the blues musicians moved to Chicago and then they went from playing like juke joints, which are like small bars and clubs and stuff into having to play bigger venues and then had to like amplify their instruments. Yeah. Um, And that album's got like a really kind of nasty kind of raw sort of electric sound. It's, it's, it's kind of brutal. I mean, his voice is like an acquired taste as well. Because I, I was talking yeah. to someone who was like, I just can't get on board with it because it's so um, it's abrasive. So, yeah, and yeah, I know it's actually mean. Sam Phillips, who is the guy from Sun Records. Records? Yeah, that you know they had Elvis and um, Carl Perkins know. and Johnny Cash and um, Jerry Lee Lewis and all these people. He said the Howlin' Wolf was the most talented performer he'd ever worked with. Did he? Yeah, he did. He did some early stuff at Sun. Right, I didn't know that. Jesus. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It is. That's the thing with blues. It is that that sort of describes it quite well. It's like undeniably brilliant, but it's 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 an acquired taste, and you've got to be in the mood for it. You can't you can't put it on. What well, you probably do. That's 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 probably what's <laughs> different. This is what I'm get. This is what I'm guessing. Most people are like, yeah, I like a bit of blues every now and again, but I get the sense you've committed. It's a lifestyle. Yeah, <laughs> I com- I I committed into it so early, and now like I don't actually listen to it all that often now because I've listened to so much of it. Like at the moment, I've just started like listening to a lot of like dub reggae. <laughs> Which is uh, a similarly <laughs> <Right>. an acquired taste. <laughs> what a varied acquired palette you've got! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whatever music you bring up, you're gonna uh, you're gonna weed out a lot of people quick. It's, well, I right, just, it's normally when I you remember- talk about music, it's, I bet it's normally a very much one to one 
conversation. There's, not, there's never more than six of you. <laughs> I'll go, yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> Whatever I, it is. Yeah. I, um, I did a recent interview um, for Australian radio and they ask you to pick like three tracks or whatever oh, good and i picked i picked this um track by um lee scratch perry called clint eastwood rides again um <laughs> it's this insanely kind of like jittery kind of teetering sort of instrumental reggae track that kind of like builds and there's an organ in it and stuff and it's yeah. It's it's kind of mad. He sort of starts off. It's like Clint Eastwood rides again, and there's like a machine gun fire, and then the song starts. Anyway, I recently doing the comedy festival. I was at a bar and I was chatting to someone, and she said, "Oh, I heard your interview. Um, you know where you were recommending the music and stuff." And she said that reggae track you recommended. She said it's absolutely terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping that she, was going to go that way. She was like, I tried to listen to it three or four times, and she's like, it's just like it's unbearable. But I just, I was like, <laughs> I was like, it made me laugh because I said, yeah, I kind of understand. Like, I don't, I'm not, I wasn't choosing stuff that I think I, I never choose stuff that I think everyone will like. You know, if you get asked yeah. to like recommend comedians or yeah recommend stuff and I, I think what like why you recommend you know the most obvious thing that everyone's aware of yeah yeah I, lo I love the fact did you think about that that she said to you i tried to listen to it about three times even when she heard it on the radio she went Fuck, what the f no <laughs> i'll give it another try because that can't be <laughs> after the third go she, she was like he asked a national radio station to play that. I can imagine that being on in the next Sweet Home Alabama. I there was Lloyd she, Langford. Uh, he won't be back for a while. She said, uh, I, I, could, I could see that you were really passionate about it, but I just don't... Like, I guess there's certain types of music that just people don't... It just leaves them cold. I think that's, and yeah. I think that's acceptable. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's some stuff where you think, well, I could understand why people wouldn't like this. So, I'll, you know, I won't push it on them. I can see. But you seem to like just that kind of thing. <laughs> of, of all different sorts, from reggae to blues, keep it really, really acquired. Yeah. I like that. But you were. So, what age were you when you first listened uh, to Howling Wolf? Uh, I reckon I was like 15 or 16, maybe. All right. And then so did that start quite a long obsession from then? So you were listening to everyone else at that time. You were a bit younger than me, but I imagine it still would have been Britpop and the end of Britpop and Travis and stuff like that. And you're listening to Howling Wolf. I never... I, I, I sort of... Very early on, I there was so much chart music that I just didn't understand or like get on board with. Yeah. I remember Britpop and the big deal with um, Roll With It versus Country House, I think yeah. it was, for the, for the for the, um, one Radio 1. Singles, yeah. Yeah. And then, I don't know, oh, like Oasis just, I was always just like, you know, when they were like, oh, we're the best band in the world. And I was just like, you're not even the fucking best band from Manchester. Like, shut up. <laughs> There's a lot of, there was a lot of that sort of like, you know, machismo and like swinging dick, like we're the best. And I don't know, I, I sort of didn't understand or really get into like a lot of like that kind of stuff. And also I would always, you go to like HMV or, you know, the standard music shops and they they always seem to have the same kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, especially if I, I was, like, into blues music, they'd have the same fucking B.B. King compilation, or they'd have... Oh, yeah. And you sort of go, oh, there's, like, other second-hand shops and, like, specialist music shops, and there's a lot more interesting stuff to discover. And, like, what I do now at the moment is I regularly just go into second-hand shops and just look through the music and just pick stuff that looks interesting and just listen to... Because it's, like a quid or something and you go well if i don't like it then i don't well, care because i'll just give it back to the shop you say that 
about it being the same music in every HMV, which it is. <laughs> but then I find charity shops. Let me let me go through my list. Daniel O'Donnell. <laughs> uh, there'll be a Bewitched. <laughs> there'll be a lot of Cliff Richard. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of Drek and lots of yeah, like. But you will find a gem that you would never find in a HMV. Is what yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. you can find. You can find. St- and also, it's like you go in the shop and you're like, I don't know what I'm going to buy because I don't know what's in here. So, yeah. I, so it's kind of. Um, but you are right. There's a lot of like digging through absolute dross to yeah, find something. There's a good. lot of Tom Jones in there. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't do anything said against Tom Jones. Oh, of course you wouldn't. No, I'm just saying. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying. God, I didn't mean, I just, I just offended your whole race of people. Then <laughs> didn't mean it like that. I mean, uh, there's uh, the same stuff. There'll be. Hang on. There'll be um, Babylon. David Gray. That'll definitely be in there. Oh, White yeah. Ladder. That'll be there. Natalie and Bruglia will be there. Um, but yeah. That is that is the thing of it from the because do- I love a I love a blues documentary I love a music documentary blues ones oh, yeah, are always yeah. really good because the thing with blues music as well is some of it sounds uh, is it like grainy no that's not the word where it sounds a bit crackly and you can almost you can almost like hear the hut in Mississippi as they're playing do you know what I mean you can hear this you can kind of hear people fucking moving in the background and stuff <laughs> like that I love that. But that's the thing about it. I think did that what you like about it as well because you've got to search a lot of it out because blues, there's they're still doing it now. They're still sort of unearthing stuff and people. There was like uh, I can't remember his name. Lomax was it Lomax? Alan Lomax, yeah, yeah. He kind of went back and searched through Mississippi and stuff to find musicians, and there's still there's still a bit of that now, isn't there, with blues where you. Because look, you started at electric kind of blues, which is like before that it was all one man with an acoustic guitar, wasn't it? So yeah, this- yeah. I, it, I mean, the, a lot. Obviously, all the early recorded stuff. Um, I think Robert Johnson. He's playing a acoustic guitar like in a hotel room. Um, yeah. That's that's how he was. How his thirty odd records were recorded. Um, but then, yeah, I went like forwards and backwards, and like I like the old, um, <clears throat> the older stuff, the acoustic stuff as well. I think a lot of the early stuff is like it's badly recorded, or the recordings have deteriorated. Yeah, it's quite so hard it, to listen pe- to, isn't it? People can find it harder to listen to. Yeah. Um, but no, there's stuff um, like um, Booker White or like those guys with it playing like um resonator guitar with steel strings yeah. um and steel guitar you know like um on the front of the um dire straits album oh yeah yeah brothers in arms yeah. one of the one of those guitars yeah and um they are loud like he's yeah. like he's really smashing the shit out of it and you can hear it on the record just fine <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's clear enough um <laughs> But did did you sort of like more the when they because they went most blues didn't they go from Mississippi to Chicago because of because of the cotton fields because of um they got tractors basically didn't they so they had to go to Chicago for jobs they went to, yeah they went and migrated to the cities for like work and better and all, all lives bigger and venues stuff. like you said and it was all electric do you prefer that bigger kind ve- of I think the Chicago stuff of like the probably late fifties, kind of up to like the mid sixties, is like the best in in my opinion. But yeah, um, it's sort of you know, I think a lot of things in life um, then white people got involved and made it worse. <laughs> blues, blues Basically, music is very much of- a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's basically uh, a history of civilization. White people got involved and made things worse. Um, <laughs> that sums up but blues those, those, and civilization. <laughs> the, those some of the guys like the Stones and stuff, and um, they kind of and the Beatles as well. I think they brought that kind of music um, to like a wider audience, and people. There were musicians that were like. I think a guy called Furry Lewis, who was like, he was like a street 
cleaner and because he'd, he'd recorded all these sides in like the 30s and 40s then went back to his normal job and then was like rediscovered in the 60s because there was a kind of folk blues boom and th- they just found him just working like cleaning streets and stuff and then he was on tour again and performing <laughs> and like had like a whole kind of reinvigoration of a, a career and like there's lo- there was there's quite a few examples of that people like Alan Lomax and people like that who initially went around recording people and yeah. kind of like for historical documents you know what what do the people sound like here and not just blues music like country music and Appalachian music and all this kind of stuff because he was like an ethno musicologist like I want to basically have like a, um, an archive of American music and then in the 60s all these guys went out and was like oh, I wonder if I could find this old blues musician and the people was they, they were still about you know they were kind of largely ignored and they but then they were kind of put back into the spotlight I think Bob Dylan and people you know he was he was playing a lot of blues music and playing f- folk songs and stuff I think and that also helped you know um, shine the spotlight on these artists that people weren't familiar with or had forgotten about oh it's brilliant yeah it's like a uh, it's like old old comedians suddenly getting a part in a sitcom <laughs> <laughs> it's like Cannon and Ball are back <laughs> Bobby Ball's in uh, Not Going Out <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, that's that. Yeah, I saw a thing of, uh, and it keeps happening, doesn't it? They keep they uh, like in the eighties. I can't remember who it was. Someone in the eighties. I remember it was about seventy odd, and then suddenly he was he was a uh, suddenly massive. He had number one. I can't remember what song it was, but yeah, that, that must be amazing. Just be in your little town, and uh, you know he uh, he's a musician. Yeah, he recorded a couple of songs once, did he? <laughs> Heard of any of them? Nah. And then suddenly he's fuck. He's gone on tour. They come back and he's just cleaning. Oh, that'd be easy, you, easy deal to make as well. They must do you know sh- nothing for those tours? Do you want to stay here and clean, do or uh, <laughs> you want to get some of those nipples that you used to sing about? <laughs> do you know um, Saul Bernstein, Steve yeah. Jameson? Yeah, you're not going to compare him to an old blues so- singer, are you? <laughs> Well, I was gigging with him once in Sheffield, and he was. Uh, we were talking about music and stuff, and he was. I didn't. I didn't really know him very well, but he was. Oh telling yeah, he me was about, a musician, wasn't he? Yeah, he was very good friends with um, Mark Bolan. Yeah, and um, also he was saying, "Oh, you know, I had a song, and um, you know, I did Top of the Pops and all that." And I was like, "Oh, all right." And uh, <laughs> his song was. Uh, the band was called Nosmo King and the Jarvels, and the song's called Goodbye, Nothing to Say, I think. Mm-hmm. And he's like telling me this story, and it was like, yeah, it's this kind of like late period, kind of Northern Soul kind of song and stuff. And I was like, all right. And the barmaid in the pub was like, oh, we've got that on the jukebox. And no uh, way. Really? And put, put his song on the um, jukebox, and it, it was an absolute fucking banger. And uh, <laughs> she was like, I'm putting it on again. It was so good. And he was really, like, made up with it. He was like that. He was like, he had, like, a little tear in his eye, I think. He was, um, he was overwhelmed by it. I thought it, was so, I thought it was so cool. And then, I like, the, you can see the footage on YouTube of the, of the performance. I think I've seen that. I don't know who sent me that. Maybe it was on Facebook or something at some point. Yeah, it could have been. You've seen, you seen Steve <laughs> Jameson here. And he was pretty cool looking, wasn't he? Yeah. But he did that song and thought, I want to do an old Jewish comedian character. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a nice moment you saw, the barmaid going, hey, I know that song, putting it on and yeah. then putting it on again. Yeah, it was very good. Oh, nice. did he write the song or sing it? sing it I think he did I think there was also a thing further down the line where someone ripped it off and they did a version a pretty much an identical version of it and yeah he got he basically said no I'm not not having that and <clears throat> I think they ended up winning some kind of legal battle against the other person oh really very Good shady on. business isn't it the record industry 
Yeah, I mean, what what we like to do in comedy, if someone steals stuff, is just slag them off <laughs> constantly <laughs> until everyone knows about it. That's what we do. That's how we deal with it. There's no no legal involved. Just they will get relentlessly slagged off. <clears throat> to well, you you bump into members of the public and they go, "Oh, you're a comedian." I tell you, who I like, and they tell you, and you go, "Yeah, he's a thieving fuck." <laughs> <laughs> That's how we do it, and they look upset and then it's awkward and confused. Yeah, because uh, why you would say that and shatter their hero's <laughs> reputation, and then and then you have to talk about something else. Um, but there's no legal involved. <laughs> there is that. But uh, so when you so when you were a teenager, what were all your mates listening to? They were all into like the charts and stuff. But you were just how long? So all through your late teens, you were into blues. Would you say? Uh, no, I mean, there was like, we we would go out on the weekends and go to like clubs and stuff. And, you know, yeah. I, like I wasn't going to like blues clubs or jazz clubs or anything. <laughs> 16. <laughs> we Six were a little smoky pipe jazz club. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Smoking a pipe. Um, I would go out and like listen to like the, you know, the usual kind of music the music that was being played in clubs and all that but like I wasn't really you know it was it was always for me it was always like this is what you do you know because you're like you, you're a teenager and the, like you're growing up this is the music that's in the charts or is popular or whatever and this yeah. is the music but um yeah I didn't really care what other people were doing like the first <laughs> The first albums I bought were in Woolworths in um, yeah. Aberavon Town Centre on cassette. I bought um, Appetite for Destruction by Guns N' Roses. Yeah. And then a 1950s compilation of rock and roll songs. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I bumped nice. into a mate from school and he was like, what are you buying? And I was like showing him the cassettes and he was like, what the fuck is this? 1950s rock and roll stuff and I was like I don't know I just I, I want to listen to it so I bought it yeah that sounds fair now isn't that funny when you were young when you were young a teenager I remember that that the stuff that you mentioned that people took the piss out of and uh, now it seems completely normal that I remember listening to Chuck Berry and Buddy Holly oh yeah when I was a teenager which seems completely standard now like, if someone told you that, you wouldn't bat an eyelid now. But I remember as a teenager, everyone going, fucking what? What? You had my, to take that. My <laughs> my first ever gig was Chuck Berry and um, Little Richard. Um, Your first gig in, that you went to see? Yeah, my first musical gig. I was maybe 11 or 12. My dad and my grandfather were really into rock and roll and... Chuck Berry, Little Richard, and Fats Domino were playing Birmingham NIA. And me, my grandfather, my dad, and my brother went to the show. And we uh, we stayed in a travel, I think we stayed in a travel lodge. I'd never been to Birmingham before, so I was just like, what? Like, it blew my mind, like, the amount of people and, like, the hustle and bustle lodge. and stuff. <laughs> what, <Yeah>. a <laughs> what a night. What a night. You've travelled from Port Talbot? Yeah, up to Birmingham. And Bloody Fats hell. Domino wasn't there because he was ill. Um, so Chuck Berry and Little Richard just did more stuff. And Little Richard came up to me in the crowd and gave me a signed photograph and um, told me to follow the path of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is which this- I... I I haven't done. <laughs> You've Sorry. defied Little Richard. <laughs> Sorry, Little Richard, I haven't done that. He told you directly to do that, Lloyd? Yes, Specifically. he did. Hang on, is he... this some strange dream you've had? <laughs> Talk me through no, this again. Got You've the... gone to Birmingham to see Little Richard and Chuck Berry, and he's come up to you in a crowd. Fudd Stormer was supposed to be there and was ill and my grandfather was very annoyed and then years later Fats Domino survived Hurricane Katrina so I figure he must have been ill to miss Birmingham NIA <laughs> he must have really been out of sorts um, 
<laughs> Little Richard then, ga- yeah, he he gave me like a sight. You know, like you you see them in comedy clubs. You know, almost like yeah. a little little um fo- so- photograph with a name at the bottom with a little gap underneath. He gave me one of those, and he was like, "You follow the path of our Lord Jesus Christ." And I subsequently found out that he was on tour in Australia in the fifties, I think it was, or early sixties, and he saw Sputnik, the, um, you know, the space satellite or whatever it yeah. was in the sky. And he thought it was a fireball that had been um, sent by God. And he stopped performing rock and roll because he was like, it's a message from God that like rock and roll is sinful and bad and stuff. And he kind of f- just stopped doing rock and roll music for a long time and started doing like gospel and stuff. And it so, he was sort of at the height of his fame. Maybe it was later than, 50, maybe it was early 60s. He was at the height of his fame and he was like, I'm renouncing all this rock and roll. And then obviously, I think after, after a few years doing gospel, he was like, oh, I'll get back into the rock and roll, I think. Yeah, what someone <laughs> pointed out. No, mate, that was, that was Sputnik. <laughs> <laughs> was it? Oh, fuck. <laughs> I've stopped I've commercially. That has really not done me any favours. <laughs> Is that really true? I've never heard that. His, I bought his this autobiography. Is, this is a typical kind of Lloyd Langford story. Whenever I talk to you, I always describe this. Whenever I describe you to people, I always say, Lloyd will tell a story about something and it, it will say it in a very slow, considered way and you'll think, there's not a lot in this story. It's just a normal story. And then just these nuggets of mental information appear like little Richard came up to me and said follow the Lord Jesus Christ that's just dropped in out of nowhere and then he saw Sputnik thought that was a meteorite from God yeah yeah (laughs) I've never heard this but how did how this was a massive venue when you saw them and he picked you out yeah you were about how old did you say 12 13 I know if it's um, I think it's a Henny Youngman joke where he says um, my seats were so bad at the baseball that from where I was the game was just a rumour <laughs> we were we were like as far back as you could get and the other thing was that all these people dressed in like as like Teddy Boys 1950s like old people dressed like yeah. I imagine they dressed when they were kids and it was bizarre. Like, I was 11 or 12, and I was like, this is, like, wild. And we had binoculars to watch the show. It was one of those, like, this is how far away you are. And yeah. he came into the crowd and kind of walked. There was a, basically where we were sat, there was, like, a walkway. And he, yeah, I think it was at the end. My, maybe it was at the end of the show. He came up and gave me this, um, you know, signed photograph. I wish I... It's in, it's back in Wales uh, somewhere. I don't even know where it is actually. It's probably in a lot like, uh, along with my childhood stuff. Otherwise, I'd be able to send you a, a, a scan of it. So you've got swimming certificates, scout badges, <laughs> signed photo from Little Richard. <laughs> it's Little probably Richard. been. It's probably signed by like you know his one of his roadies or something. You know he's probably yeah. some poor bastard backstage just like having a. I'm going to do hundreds of these photos. Did he, I don't hand know you, he... did he hand you this during a song or after the gig? No, it was. I think it was at the end of the show. I think oh, he kind okay. of... He was very... Oh. Um, like, he was very... F- effusive and grandiose. And, like, he uh. was... Uh, like, you know, people were, like, were kiss, you know, kissing his hand and all that. Like, he was... Like, yeah, like he was a he, he was a, a superstar. Right, I, I, I think he saw like, like a little Welsh kid with a big face and was like, what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> I didn't want to have to say it because I've got a big face as well. <laughs> but I did I did imagine you probably had quite a beaming, smiley face as an 11-year-old. <laughs> Amongst all these older people, it's just your big beaming face. <laughs> he was to pick you out. From, he probably saw you from the stage. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I thought I thought this was like you were four rows back mid song. He's handed you a sign. For, I didn't realize no, he was sort no, of no. walking around, couldn't find his dressing room. 
<laughs> just saw you in the crowd follow funny if he said follow Jesus Christ and do you know where the backstage area is <laughs> can't Spiral fucking find it up. anywhere that is brilliant and um, so you still followed the blues but just not the Lord Jesus Christ um, no I never I didn't really get me into religion that but that is one of the that I've heard some now I've been asking people quite a lot what was their first gig and there's been some good ones and first records have been quite funny like Ben Norris at the age of seven bought Bohemian Rhapsody <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's been some funny first gigs ever my first gig was slightly similar mine was I was a bit older I was with my dad as well with Bob Dylan at Wembley but dad and Whoa. granddad and brother Little Richard and Chuck Berry that's a, that's a cracking first gig was Chuck Berry yeah, good? Was, yeah, they were both. I mean, they were both. They were both like into it and performing well. And I think I th yeah, I mean, I've seen more. Or I you know later videos of Chuck Berry where he's just like unable to do it, and it's yeah. kind of sad. I went to see. This is another rock and roller, but I went to see Jerry Lee Lewis once in what, what's the venue called in Chalk Farm. Uh, I, at the for Kentish Town Forum. All right, yeah. And um, he had Wanda Jackson on, who was like a very famous kind of like rockabilly star, and she like couldn't remember the words to her songs and stuff, and it was pretty bad. Like I felt sorry for her, and then Jerry Lee Lewis, who's like a cantankerous cunt of the best of times yeah would be like berating his drummer like mid-song and he'd be like this guy can't keep time and was like shouting at the drummer and he did it was one of those it was one of those gigs like where i was like i want to see him live but i realize that they you know it's a bit i guess bob dylan has a similar kind of reputation like yeah. sometimes he's great and sometimes you aren't aware what songs he's singing and you've just got to kind of take a punt yeah. Um, he had so many support acts. Like, I reckon me and my mate, we arrived at Kentish Town Forum at, like, 7 o'clock. I reckon he went on about, like, 10.30, did, like, 25 minutes or half an hour and just got up and walked off the stage. Really? And all the lights... Yeah, the lights came up. And there was an like, old rock and roll guy next to me. And I said to my mate, he's... he's I reckon he'll come back on and do an encore. And this old rock and roll guy in front of me just turned around and just went, he never does encores. And that was like the, that was like the end of the show. Fucking he just, hell. he was, he was, I mean, he's, he's mad. And I've, I've read, like his, there's a, a great bi biography of him by a guy called Nick Tosh. It's called Hellfire about how insane he is, how he like shot one of his bandmates and like, He's he also renounced rock and roll because um, he thought it was like the work of Satan. I wonder, but it's, I tell you what's quite funny the thought of those multi millionaire, not all of them are, but like uh, really rich rock stars that renounce rock and roll because of uh, God. Do you think they like return the house that they bought with <laughs> rock and roll? <laughs> well, I better take all these cars back and. Um, I don't think the wife will be interested anymore. Uh, she's here for one thing. Uh, <laughs> it's purely gospel from here on in. I better look for a, <laughs> better look for a two bedroom flat to rent. <laughs> I wonder how committed they are to renouncing rock and roll. Yeah, I'd, I, it's really funny from from like a stand ups like well, you know when you do a gig and there's like ninety people and you realise that the staff are there. For you, you know, when you see the front of house staff and you think they're, they're only here because of me. <laughs> Jesus. But to do like a full like gig in a massive venue where there's hundreds of staff and it's, you know, advertised everywhere, it's been on telly and then just do half an hour. <laughs> yeah, that'll do. Fuck them all. <laughs> I can't. I, I respect the that on level, but you've got to be mad. The best one I've seen is um, <clears throat> I went to see Van Morrison at the oh, at Royal Albert Hall. He's mad as well, isn't he, apparently. He he does a great thing where they, he did the show. It was for like the London Blues Festival and 
he had a couple of like guest musicians up and guest singers and stuff as well. And he, he did like a fair old show, but then at the end of the show, the band play Gloria and he kind of sings a bit at the start and does that. And then he just kind of walks off and the band is still playing Gloria. You know, it's, I don't know how long the song is, but they, they play it for like 10 minutes or something, but he, Van Morrison just walks off the stage and um, leaves the venue and <laughs> gets in his car and just drives off. So, like, the, the gig is, like, still happening. And, uh, he, yeah, he beats the traffic. <laughs> <laughs> He's ordering a starter somewhere. People are, people are still clapping while he was going. People are... Should we go soup? People are, <laughs> people are still in his show when he is not. I love, I love that. I mean, I've known comedians do that, um, but <laughs> not to that level. Well, I, I, when I do a gig, I, I mean, p- people have left my show while I'm still there. I'm the opposite. <laughs> I think you can mentally disassociate doing a comedy gig, but to physically disassociate is probably poor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. I've done gigs where mentally I've been at home. <laughs> I've been at home uh, banging through some chocolate biscuits while still on stage, but uh, <laughs> to, do, oh, to get to that level would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> Just walk off. <laughs> oh, they're still playing your song. They don't need me here for this. <laughs> they know it. They'll sing along. Bollocks to all of them. <laughs> they're not even looking at me anymore. But uh, when, when you when uh, this morning, well, not for you because you're in uh, you're in Australia, but when uh, you sent an email about saying about you know meeting up on zoom and you sent a photo of recent purchases of albums you've bought recently yeah. firstly yes i'm very happy to say this gets mentioned quite a lot uh that you're still buying albums yes uh, i still buy cds i still get i still buy dvds and resent the attitude i get from people who still buy dvds um I still buy cds but you sh- you sent a photo and there was, uh, there was hundreds of them how many CDs have you yeah. bought recently? I I go to like second hand shops a lot and um just like pick up stuff really cheap and there's lots of good record shops and stuff in Melbourne so I well like if something like takes my fancy I'll just I'll just buy it. Like I don't usually spend too much money. Like the um the the second hand shops they're like you know, a quid each or something. Yeah, yeah, and uh, obviously the music shops are more expensive, but um, yeah, well, like a- anything, like I've been buying like dub reggae, lots of jazz, um, yeah. like golden era um, hip hop, um, some country stuff, just like anything. That I'm just like, oh yeah, I'll just have a crack at that, and like if it's not good, I just take it back. Really nice. Yeah, um, it's just I mean. I because I, I I find stuff that I'll be like I would never find this in the shop I would never try to listen to this I think it's difficult like Spotify whatever you kind of I don't know I think you often just um fall back to listening to stuff you already know yeah um though it does have recommendations like if you like this kind of music then maybe you should try that but um yeah, yeah I often I'll often look at albums and look at the musicians on them and be like oh, I, I like this person or like this you know guy or or woman um, I'll, I'll buy this album just because one of the musicians is like, i've got other stuff that i yeah. like them on yeah i do that you're like a sort of like a a collector i am sort of. yeah it's it's teetering on the edge of hoarding i think no no a, yeah no record collection it's not called a record hoarding is it <laughs> it's a collection there's a reason you're allowed to do it you're going to pass that on to someone one day that is going to be like, whoa, there's going to be no end of shit in there that people have never yeah, heard of. Th- there's a lot of stuff. Do you get, uh, do you get annoyed? I've got a mate who goes to, um, second, goes to charity shops quite a lot. Rob in Ballam. He, um, he gets vinyl quite a bit as well. Yeah. He, uh, I like it. He gets annoyed in charity shops where they're, <laughs> it's like three, four pound for a CD. He's like, what? Three, but it's not a fucking co- record collector <laughs> shop. This is a charity shop for a reason. Should be a pound in here. Can't be more than that. Do you get annoyed with the in, prices? 
I was in Sydney recently and I'd gone to this record shop and the guy was like, oh, I've got another shop around the corner and we've got loads of stuff in there that we're still kind of sorting through. So come back like on Friday or Saturday. So I went back there and he was a bit eccentric, this guy, but I was like, I'll go back and have a look in this other shop. And his wife was in the shop and she was insane. She had like a bunch of volunteers and they were going through the records and she was like barking orders at them. Like, you need to look up the price on eBay. You need to look up the price on Discogs. You need to do this. You need to do that. And a lot of what she was saying was just mad. And I tried to buy like a John Col- Coltrane CD. This is a jazz CD. I was like, I'll take a punt on this, but like nothing was priced. Yeah. So then she was like, right, I'm going to, I'm going to find out how to price this now. And then like went up on Discogs and was like, all right, I'll pr- price it for the highest it's ever sold for. And I was like, well, you've got to price it for like the average price, surely. And she was like, no. And then she started looking at where it was, it was being sold. In front of you. Like, it, yeah, just on a laptop, just like going through all oh. this different... Cr- then she was like, oh, right, I'm going to go... this? I, I'm going to go on eBay now and like look for it on eBay. And she was like, there's one on eBay for like... 15 quid or something and I was like yeah but it hasn't been sold like, <laughs> yeah. there's a like, lot of stuff on eBay for a lot of prices <laughs> I, I was trying to say to her you like you, you need to look at how much the the album has been sold for in the past because if just because someone is selling one on Discogs for like 100 quid yeah it doesn't mean it's worth 100 quid like and, and you need to you do all ar- this before you open the fucking <laughs> shop not with me stood here awkwardly <laughs> I had like 10 minutes of waiting for her and eventually she was just like, yeah, I'll give it to you for a five. And I was like, okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> I, th- I, I, say about, I say this about you as well, Lloyd. You're a nutter magnet. Yeah. You just attract these people. It just wasn't worth... Like, I was like, I want the CD, but I like I don't want to watch you find <laughs> the history of how often and how much it's been so far online. Like, Yeah, a long internet haggle yeah it was it was mad so i do i you do often get that in like secondhand shops or um charity shops or whatever where like there's one i went in there's a big one near me that i went into just after lockdown had um finished and yeah. two guys started like pushing each other and telling each other to fuck off because they weren't giving each other enough space at the CD section. Oh, nice. People get oh. very territorial. Like, if they get there first, yeah, they'll sort of make themselves large, you know, yeah. like in the animal kingdom to, to ward off predators um, so that someone else doesn't jump yeah. in there and get any of the cranberry CDs before they can. <laughs> yeah, full, full contact <laughs> sifting. <laughs> <laughs> Full contact sifting is a funny way of describing what that is, yeah. yeah I went yeah. into the shop the other day and there was a guy. The thing that really annoys me is when they, all the CDs are like, or albums are stacked properly, like you can read the spines, and then you get someone that just pulls them out one by one and just leaves them just yeah. in a mess. Yeah, yeah. And there was a guy in the shop the other day that I went into a shop to look for music and he was doing that and I, I just had to leave. <laughs> you can't engage with these people they're animals <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, what a barbaric arsehole I thought, thought you stood there going I really I really want this obscure blue CD but I can't watch what this guy's doing I can't yeah he, I couldn't get I couldn't get around him you know he was just like yeah. in the way and he was just like he's just like pulling them out and then just leaving them in a mess and um I can imagine yeah. this is why John Richardson probably never goes into a record shop. <laughs> that would break him, wouldn't it? I um, think he buys his vinyl online. Yeah, he can't deal with people or things being messed up in order <laughs> in a record shop. That oh, that would do his head. It does my head in. Um, and I see the people who work there. I sometimes see them going back, and you hear them going, "Oh, for fuck!" <laughs> but yeah, we spend all day just going, "Who, who does that?" 
who can't who doesn't know how an alphabet works what the fuck is bewitched <laughs> doing with led zeppelin <laughs> <laughs> and what was the thought process that you had bewitched and you went nah actually I'll go Led Zeppelin <laughs> <laughs> well what, what was um, uh, to, fi- to finish off here what, w- what was uh, the last sort of because uh, I, I, you don't often talk to people now that spend that amount of time in record shops that you, you do or, or just shops looking for CDs what was the last thing you bought that was only a couple of quid and you thought, I'll just give it a go. I'll just give it a go. You weren't even that sure of it. And now you're like, how have I lived to this point in my life without this <laughs> album? Oh, that is a good question. Have you bought uh, something recently? I in that pile, bought... that photo you sent me, that must, there must have been 40, 30, 40 CDs in there. In that pile, there was something actually that I bought for $2, one pound, um, a guy called Clifton Chenier, who is known as the King of the Zydeco, um, <laughs> which is like New Orleans kind of jazz and blues kind of mixed up together. He plays an accordion. He has a band with a guitar and drums and everything. And he sings like in French sometimes, and sometimes he sings in English. And I don't have any of his music and I don't really I have a couple of Zydeco tracks by him because he's basically the if you're going to listen to Zydeco music which I, I guess you probably aren't he's the guy <laughs> to he's the guy to go to he's the fucking main man in terms of Zydeco guy. music if you don't want to listen to that that's <laughs> <laughs> that's your go-to he's the, guy he, he's the creme de la creme of Zydeco and um, yeah. I bought it was like two bucks and yeah. um, I put it on today, and it's fucking great. Oh, lovely! Oh, wow! Sort of like surprise. jazzy, sort of like jazzy rock and roll, um, kind of up, really up tempo, kind of New Orleansy, kind of party music. Oh, this you struck gold there. This is I know. And it was two, it written was like, all over it. It was like two bucks, and I bought. Um, <clears throat> what else did I buy in that shop? I bought a reggae dub album by a guy called Mikey Dread, which is really good. I listened to that today. Lots of like sound effects like um animals and stuff mooing and <laughs> dogs barking like 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 overlapped on top of this really heavy dub reggae and him doing like little raps and like introductions and stuff. I bought um Old Dirty Bastards first album because I think I had it in London, but I, but I um, haven't got it here. And then I, the CD doesn't work, All in right. the, in the in my drive. So, but it was like five bucks. Where do you listen to music? You're saying you're listening to all this. How if, where are you listening to this? I have a, uh, like a, I have a MacBook that still has a CD drive in it, and then I have like um, Bluetooth speakers and stuff. Oh, okay. All right. So while you're just doing stuff. I got like a CD player and all that kind of stuff, but um, that we have got less time here, uh, less space, not less in. time, less space. Yeah, I think they go hand in hand a lot. Um, um, so yeah, we've got like a Bluetooth. Oh, I listen to me a lot of music in the car as well on the radio, but also CD player. I tell you what, by the sound of what you bought there, next time you do a radio interview and they ask for three songs. <laughs> You are, you are good to go. I've got enough to really upset that woman again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's going to track you down again. I imagine her someday on the radio going, "Oh my god, that's that Lloyd Langford on again." <laughs> What's he choosing now? Oh no, I'm going to have to listen to this at least six times to e- to even get anywhere near liking this. Good idea, Lloyd. You need to do your own radio show. Obscure uh, stuff yeah. people might not like. I would love. I would love to do that. I. I. Um. I'm sure I pitched that to Radio Wales once, and they were like, "No." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. Well, Rod said that like he gets to choose a couple a week. He was choosing like a few tunes a week, a good few. But he said that it wasn't much of a struggle, but a little bit. But they are quite commercial. And, I, then, and then you pitched the idea of <laughs> some. Wh- Animal noise effect, jazz, cross, act blues. Actually, 
actually one time doing his show because I always used to pick some of the music. One time, I picked um, Tom Waits' song "Bad as Me," and the yeah. producer got in touch with me and said, "I cannot play this." <laughs> Because she Tom found Wayne. it so, yeah, she found it so um, weird and sort of intense, and she was like, "You'll pick something else." <laughs> she rang you up, <laughs> upset. Oh, no, I can't, I can't play this. This is yeah, just I'm, I'm freezing to play this. I mean, it's not even. I mean, Tom Waits is pretty. Uh, I know he can be pretty outrageous, but like, it's pretty mainstream stuff. But quite in terms of yeah. in Radio Wales, yeah. So you had no chance with that. Pitch. No chance. Uh, you have to go pirate, mate. <laughs> it's the only way for you yeah I think uh, so it's been bloody lovely to talk to you Lloyd if nothing else just to, just to be able to talk to you on the other side of the planet it's the only thank way you, I get Andrew. to talk to you now thank you very much for coming on I really enjoyed that and uh, and uh, I feel there is a shitload more music that you could be talking about yes you, but you, you're not a music pusher though Lloyd in all the time I've known you you kind of you're just very uh I get the feeling it's quite a solitary kind of uh, activity for you. No, the music me. you listen to is not arms around each other, <laughs> oasis, communal. No, it's pushing people away. <laughs> that is what you do. Good on you. Thanks, mate. Cheers. <laughs> A podcast from producer paul.co.uk.